the second voyage of HMS Beagle, from December 27, 1831 to October 2, 1836, was the second survey expedition of HMS Beagle, under Captain Robert Fitzroy who had taken over command of the ship on its first voyage after the previous captain committed suicide. Fitzroy had already thought of the advantages of having an expert in geology on board, and sought a gentleman naturalist as a supernumerary who could be his companion while the ship was at sea. The young graduate Charles Darwin had hoped to see the tropics before becoming a parson, and accepted the opportunity. By the end of the expedition he had already made his name as a geologist and fossil collector, and the publication of his journal which became known as the Voyage of the Beagle gave him wide renown as a writer. The Beagle sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, and then carried out detailed hydrographic surveys around the coasts of the southern part of South America, returning via Tahiti and Australia after having circumnavigated the Earth. While the expedition was originally planned to last two years, it lasted almost five. Darwin spent most of this time exploring on land, three years and three months on land, eighteen months at sea. Early in the voyage he decided that he could write a book about geology, and he showed a gift for theorizing. At Punta Alta he made a major find of gigantic fossils of extinct mammals, then known from only a very few specimens. He ably collected and made detailed observations of plants and animals, with results that shook his belief that species were fixed and provided the basis for ideas which came to him when back in England and led to his theory of evolution by natural selection. Aims of the Expedition The main purpose of the expedition was to conduct a hydrographic survey of the coasts of the southern part of South America as a continuation and correction of the work of previous surveys, to produce nautical charts showing navigational and sea depth information for the Navy and for commerce. An Admiralty Memorandum set out the detailed instructions. The first requirement was to resolve disagreements in the earlier surveys about the longitude of Rio de Janeiro, which was essential as the base point for meridian distances. The accurate marine chronometers needed to determine longitude had only become affordable since 1800, the Beagle carried 22 chronometers to allow corrections. The ship was to stop at specified points for four-day rating of the chronometers and to check them by astronomical observations. It was essential to take observations at Porto Praia and Fernando de Naranja to calibrate against the previous surveys of Owen and Foster. It was important to survey the extent of the Abrol Haas archipelago reefs, shown incorrectly in Roussan's survey, then proceed to Rio de Janeiro to decide the exact longitude of Vilgagnon Island. The real work of the survey was then to commence south of the Rio de la Plata, with return trips to Montevideo for supplies. Details were given of priorities, including surveying Tierra del Fuego and approaches to harbors on the Falkland Islands. The west coast was then to be surveyed as far north as time and resources permitted. The commander would then determine his own route west, season permitting, he could survey the Galapagos Islands. Then the Beagle was to proceed to Point Venus, Tahiti, and on to Port Jackson, Australia, which were known points to verify the chronometers. No time was to be wasted on elaborate drawings, charts and plans should have notes and simple views of the land as seen from the sea showing measured heights of hills. Continued records of tides and meteorological conditions were also required. An additional suggestion was for a geological survey of a circular coral atoll in the Pacific Ocean including its profile and of tidal flows, to investigate the formation of such coral reefs. Context and Preparations The previous survey expedition to South America involved HMS Adventure and HMS Beagle under the overall command of the Australian commander Philip Parker King. During the survey Beagle's captain, Pringle Stokes, committed suicide and command of the ship was given to the young aristocrat Robert Fitzroy, a nephew of George Fitzroy, 4th Duke of Grafton. When a ship's boat was taken by native Fuegians, Fitzroy took some of them hostage. After their return to Devonport Dockyard on October 14, 1830 Captain King retired. 
The 26-year-old Fitzroy had hopes of commanding a second expedition to continue the South American survey, but when he heard that the Lords of the Admiralty no longer supported this, he grew concerned about how to return the Fuegians who had been taught English with the idea that they could become missionaries. He made an agreement with the owner of a small merchant vessel to take himself and five others back to South America, but a kind uncle heard of this and contacted the Admiralty. Soon afterwards Fitzroy heard that he was to be appointed commander of HMS Chanticleer to go to Tierra del Fuego, but due to her poor condition Beagle was substituted. On June 27, 1831 Fitzroy was commissioned as commander of the voyage, and Lieutenants John Clements Wickham and Bartholomew James Sullivan were appointed. Captain Francis Beaufort, the hydrographer of the Admiralty, was invited to decide on the use that could be made of the voyage to continue the survey, and he discussed with Fitzroy plans for a voyage of several years, including a continuation of the trip around the world to establish median distances. The Beagle was commissioned on July 4, 1831 under the command of Captain Robert Fitzroy, who promptly spared no expense in having the Beagle extensively refitted. The Beagle was immediately taken into dock for extensive rebuilding and refitting. As she required a new deck, Fitzroy had the upper deck raised considerably, by 8 inches, 200 mm, aft and 12 inches, 300 mm, forward. The Cherokee-class brig sloops had the reputation of being coffin brigs, which handled badly and were prone to sinking. By helping the decks to drain more quickly with less water collecting in the gunnels, the raised deck gave the Beagle better handling and made her less liable to become top-heavy and capsize. Additional sheathing to the hull added about 7 tons to her burthen and perhaps 15 to her displacement. The ship was one of the first to test the lightning conductor invented by William Snow Harris. Fitzroy obtained five examples of the Simpisometer, a kind of mercury-free barometer patented by Alexander Aidy and favored by Fitzroy as giving the accurate readings required by the Admiralty. In addition to its officers and crew, the Beagle carried several supernumeraries, passengers without an official position. Fitzroy employed a mathematical instrument maker to maintain his 22 marine chronometers kept in his cabin, as well as engaging the artist-slash-draftsman Augustus Earl to go in a private capacity. The three Fuegians taken on the previous voyage were going to be returned to Tierra del Fuego on the Beagle together with the missionary Richard Matthews. Offer of Place to Darwin Fitzroy knew that commanding a ship could involve stress and loneliness he was very aware of the suicide of Captain Stokes, and his own uncle Viscount Castlereagh had committed suicide under stress of overwork. For the first time he would be fully in charge with no commanding officer or second captain to consult, and he felt the need for a gentleman companion who shared his scientific interests and could dine with him as an equal. Early in August, he took these concerns to Beaufort, who had a scientific network of friends at the University of Cambridge. At Beaufort's request, mathematics lecturer George Peacock wrote from London to Professor John Stevens Henslow about this rare opportunity for a naturalist, saying that an offer has been made to me to recommend a proper person to go out as a naturalist with this expedition, and suggesting the Reverend Leonard Jennings. Though Jennings nearly accepted, and even packed his clothes, he had concerns about his obligations as vicar of Swaffham Bulbeck and his health, so declined. Hence Lowe briefly thought of going, but his wife looked so miserable that he quickly dropped the idea. Both recommended the 22-year-old Charles Darwin who had just completed the ordinary Bachelor of Arts degree which was a prerequisite for his intended career as a parson, and was on a geology field trip with Adam Sedgwick. On August 24 Henslow wrote to Darwin, That I consider you to be the best qualified person I know of who is likely to undertake such a situation. I state this not on the supposition of year being a finished naturalist, but as amply qualified for collecting, observing, and noting anything worthy to be noted in natural history. Peacock has the appointment at his disposal and if he cannot find a man willing to take the office, the opportunity will probably be lost. Captain Fitzroy wants a man, 
I understand, more as a companion than a mere collector and would not take any one however good a naturalist who was not recommended to him likewise as a gentleman there never was a finer chance for a man of zeal and spirit don't put on any modest doubts or fears about your disqualifications for I assure you I think you are the very man they are in search of. The letter went first to Peacock, who quickly forwarded it to Darwin with further details, confirming that the ship sails about the end of September. Peacock had discussed the offer with Beaufort, he entirely approves of it and you may consider the situation as at your absolute disposal. When Darwin returned home late on August 29th and opened the letters, his father objected strongly to the voyage so the next day he wrote declining the offer and left to go shooting at the estate of his uncle Josiah Wedgwood too. With Wedgwood's help, Darwin's father was persuaded to relent and fund his son's expedition, and on Thursday September 1st Darwin wrote accepting Peacock's offer. That day, Beaufort wrote to tell Fitzroy that his friend Peacock had succeeded in getting a savant for you a Mr. Darwin grandson of the well-known philosopher and poet full of zeal and enterprise and having contemplated a voyage on his own account to South America. On Friday Darwin left for Cambridge, where he spent Saturday with Henslow getting advice on preparations and references to experts. Alexander Charles Wood, an undergraduate whose tutor was Peacock, rode from Cambridge to his cousin Fitzroy to recommend Darwin. Around midday on Sunday September 4 Wood received Fitzroy's response, straightforward and gentlemanlike but strongly against Darwin joining the expedition, both Darwin and Henslow then gave up the scheme. Darwin went to London anyway, and next morning met Fitzroy who explained that he had promised the place to his friend Mr. Chester, possibly the novelist Harry Chester but Chester had turned it down in a letter received not five minutes before Darwin arrived. Fitzroy emphasized the difficulties including cramped conditions and plain food. Darwin would be on the Admiralty's books to get provisions, worth £40 a year, and, like the ship's officers and captain, would pay £30 a year towards the mess bill. Including outfitting, the cost to him was unlikely to reach £500. The ship would sail on October 10, and would probably be away for three years. They talked and dined together, and soon found each other agreeable. The Tory Fitzroy had been cautious at the prospect of companionship with this unknown young gentleman of Whig background, and later admitted that his letter to Wood was to throw cold water on the scheme in a sudden horror of the chances of having somebody he should not like on board. He half-seriously said that he nearly rejected Darwin on the phrenological basis that the shape, or physiognomy, of Darwin's nose indicated a lack of determination. While they continued to get acquainted, going shopping together, Darwin rushed around to arrange his supplies and equipment, getting advice from experts on specimen preservation such as William Yarell at the Zoological Society of London, Robert Brown at the British Museum, Captain Philip Parker King who led the first expedition, and invertebrate anatomist Robert Edmund Grant who had tutored Darwin at Edinburgh. Yarell gave invaluable advice, and bargained with shopkeepers so Darwin paid £50 for two pistols and a rifle, while Fitzroy had spent £400 on firearms. On Sunday September 11, Fitzroy and Darwin took the steam packet for Portsmouth. Darwin was not seasick and had a pleasant sail of three days. For the first time he saw the very small cramped ship, met the officers, and was glad to get a large cabin, shared with the assistant surveyor John Lord Stokes. On Friday Darwin rushed back to London, 250 miles in 24 hours, and on via Cambridge to arrive in Shrewsbury on September 22nd for a last quick visit to family and friends, leaving for London on October 2nd. Delays to the Beagle gave Darwin an extra week to consult experts and complete packing his baggage. After sending his heavy goods down by steam packet, he took the coach along with Augustus Earl, and arrived at Devonport on October 24. The geologist Charles Lyell asked Fitzroy to record observations on geological features such as erratic boulders. Before they left England, 
Fitzroy gave Darwin a copy of the first volume of Lyell's Principles of Geology which explained features as the outcome of a gradual process taking place over extremely long periods of time. In his autobiography Darwin recalled Henslow giving advice at this time to obtain and study the book, but on no account to accept the views therein advocated.